Welcome to another episode of Seen Any Good Films Lately, the podcast bursting with recommendations and ideas for what to watch. I'm Jason Solomons, I'll be telling you what I've seen, you'll hear what others have watched and what to look out for, and we're joined by a special guest who's leapt from football to film. You know, the film that had the most influence on me in terms of, I think, structure was Back to the Future, which is, in structural terms, an absolute masterpiece. That's ITV's intrepid touchline reporter Gabriel Clark there, who's been covering football for 30 years and who's now become a very skillful documentary maker. His latest film is Finding Jack Charlton, about the England 66 World Cup winner who became the Irish football team's most successful manager. And we find out more about Gabriel's own illustrious British film pedigree. Before we meet Gabriel Clark, let me tell you if I've seen any good films lately. I'll tell you who has seen a lot of good films lately, and that's the London Film Critics Circle members, whose awards I attended earlier this week, virtually, of course. It was particularly poignant, I guess, because I used to chair that organisation. I run the awards, I used to host uh, and present the entire ceremony, the whole show, several times, from the Landmark Hotel, the Mayfair Hotel, uh, where it is now based uh, full-time when possible, uh, and at BFI Southbank. I've been presenting individual awards, the Dillis Powell Award, also for excellence in cinema. This was the first year I wasn't involved at all, nor able to attend, so I was pleased to see that the event is in great hands and they managed to get an entertainingly short ceremony out online. The results and the nominations were a smart bunch of eclectic choices and should give you some great stuff to watch if you haven't seen some of these already. So I can recommend Rox, whose young actress, Buki Bukre, uh, won Young British Performer of the Year. Uh, it also won a prize for casting and when you see it you'll completely understand why. Uh, but this is what Buki, who was street cast and found out of nowhere from Hackney, had to say about winning Young British Performer of the Year. I'm just so pleased that people connected to the film in such a beautiful way. And a massive, massive shout out to the whole Rocks family. Because as a performer, I was just reflecting what was reflected onto me. Thank you guys so much. Peace and light from Buki B. Oh, I love that film, Rocks. Um, it's on Netflix already, and when you see it, you'll absolutely uh, fall for it too. I also love actor Riz Ahmed, and I was thrilled to see him win British Actor of the Year for his work in both Mogul Mowgli and Sound of Metal, both films you absolutely need to see. Mogul Mowgli is out already uh, on BFI Player and on DVD uh, this week, and The Sound of Metal is coming out very soon indeed. He plays a musician in both films, weirdly both about being suddenly stricken with a debilitating crisis. Here's Riz. I think it's worth noting these are both films that were really low budget independent movies with short schedules. It's often where some of the most um, heartfelt work happens and where some of the most you know hardest work happens as well. So thank you to all of our teams involved in bringing both these stories to life, kind of against the odds, really. And thank you to the London Critics Circle for shining a light on them. Uh, they're both stories about really someone who's going through a health crisis and it lands them into a kind of purgatory where they're forced to reassess what really matters and I can't help but notice that's kind of what a lot of us are going through right now um, so I hope people watching these films take some heart and some hope from them thank you very much we'll get Riz on the show soon so don't you worry check those films out they are total must sees Mogul Mowgli Sound of Metal Others to look out for are horror winner St Maud. You'll like that, if that's the sort of thing you like. We had its winning actress, Morphid Clark, on the last season of the podcast, so you can catch up with her interview, Morphid Clark. Uh, that great Chadwick Boseman performance in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Well, you know, I've been on about that for a little while on this show, so I was really pleased to see him rewarded posthumously for that film. But Director of the Year went to Steve McQueen for his mighty Small Axe series of five films, and I've been talking about that a lot on the show. Steve gave a typically robust and heartfelt acceptance speech, and here's a bit of it. I often ask myself, you no, know, why do I do what I do? Well, particularly in this time, why do I do what I do? And I do it, I think, because I'm trying to sort of find out, in a way, 
who we are or who we want to be or who we could be. And through Small X, that's what happened. You know, I'm only here because of the people who have put me here, the people who have sacrificed so much. So for me, Small X was a love letter to Black London, to Black Britain, to say thank you. And the fact that throughout the world people have received it so warmingly, um, I'm just so grateful. Um, and thank you, London Film Critics Circle, for this wonderful honor. Um, I, and I, I, I basically like to give this honor to the black community of London. Thank you so much. Yeah, and if you haven't seen all five of those small acts films, well, uh, I was thrilled to see another of my guests from the previous series take one of the acting prizes, supporting actor for the magnificent Sean Parks, who's brilliant in Mangrove. That's a film you absolutely have to see. It's on iPlayer now, along with its sort of partner film, Lover's Rock. If you haven't seen those yet, those are ones definitely to sag full. And you can see all the winners and their speeches from the awards night on the London Film Critics' new YouTube channel. Very smart. On this show, I'll of course be keeping you on top of the awards season developments, the stars and the films on Seen Any Good Films Lately, and that was just the start of it. We've got the Biffers, the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs and the Oscars all the way till the end of April. Loads to watch, loads to watch out for, so take heart, there'll be plenty of answers to that question. Seen any good films lately? The big interview on Seen Any Good Films Lately is now supported by our new mates at Strike. That's Strike, S-T-R-Y-Y-K, the distilled non-alcoholic drink with all the spirit, none of the alcohol. And clearly they've got great taste in movies. So it's a pleasure to have Strike on board to celebrate awards season with us at Seen Any Good Films lately. What better way to celebrate great times and great movies than with one of their delicious, sexy, classy drinks. So I'm mixing myself uh, not vodka, soda and lime for this bit. And you keep listening for an amazing offer coming a bit later in the show on how you can begin to share the Strike experience, the Strike drinks with us here at Seen Any Good Films lately. That's Sagfall, S-A-G-F-L, and Strike, S-T-R-Y-Y-K, a classic new combination. So now it's time for my guest, who is Gabriel Clark, ITV's long-standing touchline football reporter, veteran of World Cups, Euros, Champions League nights, and so much more. He's also turned his hand to directing documentaries recently, including one about Hollywood star Steve McQueen and his fascination with Le Mans racing. A film that played at the Cannes Film Festival. What a place to make your debut. So there was also a very moving film that he followed up with about former England football manager Bobby Robson. And now comes Finding Jack Charlton. A film which will have you out of your seat cheering and then in tears. What's football about? You're at Wembley Stadium and a ball is crossed from the right wing and you go boom. That's his medal. People say to me, was that the most memorable day of your life? Joys and management are totally different to Joys as a player. It's not the same, Jack. I caught up with Gabriel Clark to find out more about finding Jack Charlton, the films that influenced him, and to get him to talk for the very first time about the amazing film legacy of his father, who made some of the most important and impactful British films of the 1980s. Congratulations on the film, Gabriel. It's really moving and beautifully put together. It's full of memories. It's sort of about memory, isn't it, really? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Jason. Clearly, we have a a major theme, contemporary theme, in the narrative with Jack uh, living with dementia. That story is told as as we sort of thread back from the past to the present. Did you know going in that that was what you had you wanted to capture him with dementia or was it like you wanted to do a Jack Charlton doc and then found out ah that he has dementia what was the sequence my initial interest in the subject stemmed from knowing that there was a lot about Jack Charlton's story non-football wise I think that hadn't been told in relation to the significance of his time with Ireland and the impact on Ireland the relationship he had with the country of his birth having been a World Cup winner with England and how that was quite complex and discussing it with the family we knew how important potentially telling that story would be and and thanks to them and their cooperation we were able to center of the story 
than it originally would have been, but it, it is not a film about football and dementia in that sense. This is more, I think, a story, as you, you mentioned, the way in which I think uh, Jack Charlton as a, as a man um, lived a life of a unique stature and achievement. Seems to me that when you do these films, but you know, you spend your sort of working week caught up in the maelstrom and the hullabaloo of football, the touchline reporting, the kind of who's playing, who isn't, was that a good game? What was, what does this defeat mean? What does this victory mean? And we all get caught up in that. But when you do your docs, you take a back seat and you tend to look more at football as a social issue. Your Bobby Robson film, for example, these figureheads who become men of the people, very much as sort of a social document in a way, the way that football feeds communities and changes communities. And there's very much this sense of Jack Charlton, you know, energising Ireland while you put in with uh, Larry Mullen, for example, from U2. The social impact of what football and football figureheads can do seems to seems to really uh, permeate your documentaries more than you can obviously do on a touchline football interview after a match. And they're two very different things. They're two very different forms of communication. And and yeah, one one to a degree does does feed the other. I don't want to ever force it. I mean, one of one of the things that you know you, you think you have good pillars in place, but but I think you're always taking a bit of a gamble when you we set out to say, well, Jack Charlton was this this formidable, and I don't like the word icon. The challenge you set yourself, I think, once you're in as a documentary maker, is to f- uncover new things and to authenticate things and to prove things. This one seems very uh, beautifully put together, beautifully shot, but this one seemed very polished, very, you know, you had drone shots, you had beautiful uh, uh, photography. I don't know if it's the increased budget. You're getting to be able to tell the story in a very cinematic way, this one. It felt it felt that that way, with use of uh, archive, uh, use of, you know, the interviews yeah. beautifully framed. Absolutely, and no, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. It was, it was very important, I think. You have a natural setting in Ireland, um, maybe in the same way that we had in in the Steve McQueen film, Steve McQueen, The Man of Le Mans with uh, Le Mans, the racetrack. You have it you, in the same way maybe we had in the Bobby Robson film with Barcelona. You have a sort of physical geographical base that you know you can go to. But especially with Ireland, I don't want you don't want visual cliche. You know, I'm very very aware of visual cliche in it, and uh, and there's a balance I think to be struck between overusing maybe some of that. Uh, you, you, you're heading into potentially twee territory, aren't you? I think, which you also have to be careful when you you're putting that visual base down. What were the docs that influenced you? If you go. Right, right back to the great film documentaries. I mean, some of the the, the modern ones as well. But what are the ones that uh, you know that must have got into your into your head, even as a young man, or rec- recalling watching? When we were kings, although it's not it's not that old. That was nineteen ninety six, I think. The film about Muhammad Ali's rumble in the jungle. But going back to obviously something that was from seventy six. Mm. The use of the use of archive and that that's that, that unseen footage, the ability to get behind the scenes and have that privileged access, and that's what we had with Jack. We had privileged access, which counts for so much. It, re- it really, really does. There was a series that Brian Moore did for television back in the mid seventies, where he interviewed uh, Kevin Keegan, Bjorn Borg, Sevi Ballesteros. It was a series done for television, but was very cinematic and very simple. It was. It was these very famous names opening up their front rooms and uh, away from their sporting venue, which was I, I found absolutely fascinating. And we, we've actually repeated them on ITV during lockdown. So, Gabriel, what else have you been up to? What can you recommend us? Have you seen any good films lately? There's, there's an element of, of having to watch, I think, for homework, to know that you're not wasting your time watching. Uh, I do feel that a bit because when you're, for instance, I'm researching a documentary at the moment on... Uh, on Arsene Wenger and looking back at a lot of archive, using this time to do that. Oh, I'll do that for you. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, but a lot of it is toil. You know, you, you're looking for the gold and um, there's a lot of shash that you've got to, got to spin through as well. So when I'm away from the screen, I try to keep it quite disciplined at night. I'm going through Curb Your Enthusiasm at the moment. Yes. Um, which I, which I, I have to say, I hope that doesn't, doesn't say anything too much about my age, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not identifying with Larry David. But I'm going. I'm going through it uh, <laughs> because you're able to literally uh, go from one episode to the next, and I'm I'm liking more of the way in which it's been put together. I've always sort of admired that how the smallest thing becomes the biggest thing. But but the construction and the structure is something I. Uh, 
I've always been fascinated by structure. Structure itself is witty, uh, isn't it? Uh, any any yeah. executive will tell you just screenplays are all structure, you know. So you can you can cull them yeah. in between. But once you've got the the sort of posts of where you're going, I think that your curbs that's great. And the, the yeah. way that they come back to each other is funny. Yeah, and and I've so I really like to do like to look at that the, the you know the film that had the most influence on me in terms of I think structure was Back to the Future. Yes, which is in structural terms an absolute masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece in terms of the way it sows seeds, it sows plot themes, not, not just for humor, but, f- but for narrative purposes. Characters start, they obviously come back in, stories are formed, characters are formed, and then you get the payoffs later in the structure. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, on so many levels. As, as this, you know, and as the, the title says, "Back to the Future," it's it's an incredible piece of structural work, and it's had quite a big, I think, a big influence on me. Hey, 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 hey! Stop, little girl, little girl, stop! Look, I need to bore you. Hoverboard. Where is he? Here. There. What about some other films, Gabriel? What have you been watching? Do you have a a favourite sort of genre of film, a type of film that you really love? The paranoia films of the 70s. Mm. I do like those. I love those. There's a documentary edge to them. There's a, a, you know, the, the French connection, I think, stood out because everyone says gritty, but, you know, I don't really, I think because of the, the sort of authenticity it tried to capture in a, in a thriller. So I think um, that handheld camera. So I do, I do like those films in oh, a way. That, the uh, conversation is fantastic. You're a Gene Hackman fan, clearly. You've got to... Overheard words, obviously, but that, that sense of little sound ups that you hear something I do try and use a lot in the films is to when we get bits of archive hear the archive don't just have it as a visual bed find the sound ups in it yeah I remember those 70s films when I saw them that that the conversation the French connection we're talking about the parallax view parallax having view. having these sort of devastating effects on you as a as a younger man going oh my god people are corrupt you know, I, we don't have to. We, we don't have any trust in our institutions. I, I think when I was younger, I thought, well, perhaps maybe your dad was more irascible than than mine. But I, I had faith in in at least our leaders or our institutions to kind of guide us. And you watch these kind of betrayed American post Watergate, post Nam films, and you're like, oh my god, I can't trust these people. They're all crooks and villains. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I know. Obviously, I don't, I'm not sure I saw it when it first came out or really, really got it. But all no, the you, we would. Yeah, the yeah, you're going back to them. All the presidents, certainly as a, as a journalist, yes. it's one that it obviously it romanticizes to an extent. To an extent, it romanticizes. Surveillance is doing it's it. It's being done. People's lives are in danger. Wait a Maybe minute. even ours. What happened to that justice source of yours? Well, I guess I made the instructions too complicated because he thought I said hang up when I just said hang on. Oh, Jesus. The story is right. Alderman was the fifth name to control that fund, and Sloan would have told the grand jury. That. Sloan wanted to tell the grand jury. Why didn't he? Because nobody, nobody asked. Nobody asked him. The cover-up had little to do with the break-in. It was to protect covert operations and the covert activities involving the entire U.S. intelligence community. Did Deep Throat say that people's lives are in danger? Yes. What else did he say? He said everyone is involved. What was the first film you ever saw? Probably the first cinema experience yes. in Wizard of Oz. Yeah. But obviously not not the original, not when it first came out. <laughs> 1939, uh, you were there. My mum my loved that film and she dragged me along to see The Wizard of Oz when it was when it was in colour. You know, it had been rebranded in colour in, uh, and was on in the local cinema in the early 70s. Where was that? That would have been in, uh, in Ealing in London. And uh, that would have been at yeah, the, local, uh, the local cinema in Ealing, which she... She was always good at taking us along to the cinema. She liked the cinema. As a filmmaker, though, um, I didn't know this. I think when I first spoke to you, or when I you know, met you, it's in your it's in your blood. Filmmaking, isn't it, Gabriel? Did you not did you not grow up on film sets? Your father's Alan Clark, is he not? Who's one of my favourite filmmakers? I don't think we've ever actually discussed the fact that the, your dad has made like three of the most influential films for me of all time, and probably for many UK filmmakers. Alan Clark made Scum and The Firm, of course. 
course, Elephant, a, a tremendous documentary about Northern Ireland. Did he uh, school you in filmmaking? No, no, he didn't. And, uh, <laughs> my dad, my dad died relatively young, yeah. so my dad died in 1990, just after. Actually, I remember watching the, the the World Cup in Italy with him. You know, we were it was it was in hospital at the time. Oh dear. Was um, he a football fan? Yeah, he was. He was a major Everton fan, and that's sadly that's something he handed on to me. Um, <laughs> I wear that. I wear that with pride, and and we we very much had that in common. So in that sense, he he influenced me, and and yeah, certainly I watched uh, a lot of that work, especially in the eighties. So I, I was too young, really. I think in the seventies to as as he started to uh, do a lot of television uh, and theatre. In terms of influence, there wasn't a direct influence because I only started doing my own television work after my father had died, but I'd, I'd already made the decision at that point to go into journalism as opposed to theatre or, or television directing. I'm a journalist first, but I think what I've taken from my dad's work is probably that that search for authenticity, which he obviously wanted in, in his filmmaking to capture it was a very, in very, in very many ways, a documentary naturalism that he was seeking, as you know, and um, a simplicity to keep things really down to the bare minimum at the end, I think. And he certainly never liked using music, for instance. And I'm, I'm always very wary when we do our final cut about the overuse of music. Yeah. So there were there are things I think that seeped in that, that he talked to me about. I certainly wasn't on set, so drinking it all in it, it certainly didn't work like that i was i was at school being told to do my own thing and work hard. <laughs> yeah we well, don't want to be on the set of scum it, i don't think uh, one of the films that absolutely shocked me when i when i first saw it scare the living daylights out of me name and number 4737 calling sir well, this is the daddy the hard case carlin is it is it yes sir don't look much to me carlin your little toe rag is the officer at Rowley. Fancy yourself, dear Carly. Thumping officers, eh? Oh, we Speak when I tell you, lad. Oh, they sent you down here to be sorted out. You have heard of us, Carly, eh? Heard of us, have you? Yes, sir. And what did you hear? Nothing, sir. Well, I'll tell you here and now, lad, that nothing was not the correct information. Because we're having your stinking hooligan guts for garters. Right? Yes, sir. It's remarkable, Gabriel, how many British filmmakers I speak to, you know, every, every week. And they'll they'll often, they'll come down to, like, Alan Clark, what huge influence he was on them. One of the best nights out I've ever had in a film situation was an Edinburgh Film Festival, uh, which were very, it was very a big documentary festival at the time, Edinburgh Film Festival in the 90s, a night out with Ray Winston, Tim Roth... I think Oldman must have been there and it must have been an Alan Clark retrospective or something and they did a stage thing where they were all talking about him and then we went out afterwards and I happened to sort of be tagging along with them and it went on till three in the morning and it was just oh Clarky this Clarky that oh Clarky used to do this he influenced their style and their acting so much I mean they it was it was almost like he was a father figure to them yeah I think he was very much about the performance and getting performances out of out of actors so in that sense quite quite traditional directing maybe you, you would say it was it was about that if he could that that ability to connect and the charisma that I had he had I think to uh, especially connect with younger actors and find something inside them at that time that he knew they had as well as doing things that obviously he felt needed to shake people up whether it was politically or, or culturally that, that that was inside him and I, I, I haven't in any way done films that have been as politically motivated but they have been, I think, motivated by this sort of sense of um, sometimes, yeah, a sense of maybe somebody who's, whose life has really been uh, undervalued, maybe. Yeah. Somebody, somebody somebody whose achievement hasn't been seen in a way that it should have been seen. Well, some of that, some of the Jack Charlton stuff, because um, I knew I was talking to you and I, and I, I thought I would bring up your dad because we never really spoken about it. But some of that Jack Charlton archive, the, the, the footage of Ireland, the buildings, the people, some of it reminded me of those op the amazing opening shots of Rita Sue and Bob too, which are some of the great, you know, British tra tracking shots of all time. And some of them were, were definitely the you know, same sort of time, wasn't they? 80, what, what year was that? Yeah, yeah you're talking mid 80s. I yeah. think Rita Bob would have been 87, 88, but would have been filmed around 86, 87. I mean, the, the, 
the use of the steady cam my my dad didn't talk to me too much about technical things i mean i don't think technically he was necessarily that always that invested but the use of the steady cam chris mengis um who went on to direct himself chris mengis yeah. was a guy on rita sue and made in britain and um maybe the firm as well and it was that that, that revelation that he got when the steady cam arrived on the scene in in, te- in it might have been film but he was the first to use it in television really so you see in road for instance that the tracking shots in road uh which bring to life the, the roads yeah and, um that he loved that tracking shot and i i remember it resonating with me when he talked about it and i think a, a few a few cameramen that i've worked with will will moan at me for asking to do long tracking shots that they have to run up the road with me doing a piece to camera in for tv but certainly i think the transitional potential in whether it's a, a physical tracking shot done by a cameraman on a steady cam or whether it's a, a really good shot out of a car window that that visual I think offers so much. I, I really do like it as as a tool for getting inside the head, creating a sense of where you are, uh, the transitional sense that it that it offers, which I think transitions are so key in documentary. Gabriel, it's been fantastic talking to you about your 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 beautiful film, Finding Jack, very moving film, but all those other films as well. Thank you so much for sharing all those memories with us. Thank you, Jason. Gabriel Clark there, full of great films such as When We Were Kings, the best sports doc ever really, and All the President's Men, which feels just as relevant now as it did when it was made originally. And then those amazing Alan Clark films, which if you've never seen them, they are just amazing. And they introduce us to Gary Oldman, Tim Roth, Ray Winston, they're the scum, the firm made in Britain. God. They're powerful political films, yet they're essential British filmmaking. Great recommendations. Thanks, Gabriel. Just to remind you, mainly you boys out there, that it is Valentine's Day this weekend. Yes, it is. So quick, flowers, a card at least, no? How about a romantic film? Aha, I hear you say good idea, Jace. So if you want to look really classy, the most romantic film ever made is In the Mood for Love by Hong Kong director Wong Kar Wai. There's a new season of his films, restored in gorgeous 4K, now playing on BFI Player and the ICA's new streaming platform, Cinema 3. And they include some very influential films of the 1990s, such as Chunking Express, Days of Being Wild and Happy Together as well as In the Mood for Love. And they've got stars in them such as Andy Lau, who I once DJed for in Shanghai, Tony Leung, who I once met at the Cannes Film Festival, Gong Li, and Maggie Chung, who I once went on a date with in London. Just once, but I did. Combining with cinematographer Chris Doyle, Wong Kar Wai has created this unique aesthetic of woozy sexiness, exotic passion, rainstorms, Chong Sam dresses, bursts of violence and a dreamy sensuality. Just like you were planning to conjure up for Valentine's Night, right? <laughs> if I had to pick one, it would be In the Mood for Love. But Days of Being Wild was one I hadn't seen and I'd heard all about throughout the 90s. It was such a sort of key text movie for cool film goers. Uh, and I had real pleasure catching up with it just the other night. And you can see that it's an earlier version uh, of what leads into Wong Kar Wai's sort of a d- defining aesthetic uh, and the more acknowledged masterpiece of In the Mood for Love. All of Wong's films have this lovely music in them using Xavier Kuga and Nat King Cole, Latin rhythms in this Hong Kong setting. Don't forget it was uh, owned by the British at this time that most of his films were set. So you've got this very unique atmosphere going on, uh, as well as the background of uh, of Cantonese classics and Chinese culture. Wong Kar Wai is a director well worth discovering for the first time, if you haven't already, or just diving back into those lush worlds again. <laughs> Xavier Cougar and Perfidia from Days of Being Wild. One car, why not? More like. <laughs> that brings us to the end of Seen Any Good Films Lately. The answer's yes. From Rocks and Sound of Metal to All the President's Men and Rita Sue and Bob 2 to Days of Being Wild. Boy, are we good to you on this show? What fun. Thanks to my guest, Gabriel Clark. 
And thanks to our lovely new sponsor, Strike. All the spirit, none of the alcohol, all the taste too. If you want to get some Strike drinks in for the next episode, they've given us here at Seen Any Good Films lately a brilliant offer. You've just got to go to their website, strike.com, that's S-T-R-Y-Y-K.com, enter the discount code Jason 40, 40, like the number 40, Jason 40, and you get 40% off your order. So you might as well go big and get all of it, not gin, not rum, not vodka, and you're ready for the whole of the awards season with us that's seen any good films lately and our new mates at Strike. Enter the code Jason 40. And if you've seen any good films lately yourself, let me know. I'd love to share them and hear about them and get that conversation going. Email us at sagful at jasonsolomons.com. We all want to discover and rediscover and now's the perfect time. So rate us and subscribe because that just helps other people find us and then find out what to watch and then make the conversation all the merrier. We'll be back next week with more answers to that question. Jace, seen any good films lately? And this week... I'll say goodbye by saying, yeah, in the mood for love. Here's the gorgeous theme tune to play us out by Shigeru Umabayashi. See you next week. Mm-hmm.